Welcome, Kwe Kwe. My name is Crystal and I'm here to welcome you all to a virtual book launch for Nina Lakani's Who Killed Berta Casares, Dam's Death Squads and an Indigenous Defender's Battle for the Planet. Um, I'd like to open this uh, book launch, this virtual space by uh, asking you all to take a quick moment with me and ground yourself in your location. For myself, my land acknowledgement will be reflective of my Omami Winini Aki, the Algonquins of Pequaknagon First Nations territory, uh, which is just a small part of the Algonquin territory, unceded Algonquin territory. And again, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, your presence here speaks to the legacy of Berta Casares and She's an indigenous uh, Lensa woman from Honduras who was killed for her tenacity and commitment to life on this planet. Berta is one of the countless women who courageously protect Mother Earth in the face of resource extraction. Since 2014, Kairos Canadian Ecumenical Justice Initiatives has, a pro has had a programmatic focus on the gendered impacts of resource extraction in Canada and the Global South. Kairos works in partnership with women land and water defenders, primarily Indigenous women and organizations, to make visible the impacts of resource extraction on women, to draw attention to women's work in the defense of community rights and the environment, to press for Indigenous women's recognition as key policy stakeholders and decision makers through mechanisms such as free, prior, and informed consent, and is stipulated by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And we also advocate at Kairos for corporate accountability of the Canadian extractive sector operating abroad. In November 2019, Kairos launched the first phase of the Living Digital Hub, Mother Earth and Resource Extracting, Women Defending Land and Water, which brings together original and existing material to support research, advocacy, information sharing, and movement building on the gendered impacts of resource extraction. So this first phase focused almost exclusively on Latin America. The next phase, which highlights land defense in Canada, uh, will launch this Sunday on June 21st. So we're very, very honored, again, to have you all here and to have all uh, all this interest and reflection of, of, the, of the, the, call, the need for this space. And so now I'm gonna just shift and honor and introduce uh, someone, Nina Lakani, who reports on Central America for The Guardian, BBC, Al Jazeera, Global Post, The Daily Beast and elsewhere. She previously worked for The Independent and her book, Who Killed Berta Carceres, Dams, Death Squads, and Indigenous Defenders, Battle for the Planet was just published this month by Verso Books. And before getting to the discussion portion of the event, uh, Nina will be reading a brief excerpt from her book. Uh, Nina Miigwech, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, here's the book, you can see. <laughs> I was gonna speak in Spanish, but I can just see from that survey that almost everybody is from Canada. So I'm gonna speak, I'm gonna go ahead and speak in um, English. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna read a, a short extract from the book, which is the subtitle to that is Threats Were the Norm. Copin was founded in 1993 and from the very beginning upset powerful people. Military officers into contraband, logging, landowners, farming, indigenous ancestral land, all these local elites hated us because we made a difference, said Salvador Zuniga, Berta Casares' husband at the time. In the early days, Copin business was mainly con conducted at Berta's family home, and the children remember hushed discussion discussions between their parents after yet another menacing note was delivered by an unknown hand. In my earliest memories, I remember threats and insults against my parents, said um, um, Olivia Zuniga Casares, the eldest daughter. At school, there were children and teachers who said our parents were thieves, millionaires with houses in Miami. 
Bertita remembers her, Bertita, the second eldest daughter, remembers her siblings when were playing in the garden once when she was nine or 10 years old. And she and Olivia saw an unknown man outside the house with a gun. On another occasion, their dog, Chocolate, saved the nanny who was being attacked by someone from a with a knife. After that, Chocolate was our hero, said Bertita. The fact is there were so many incidents that threat seemed normal to us. Maybe that's why we believe that she would never really be killed. Threats were nothing new, but everything changed in 2013. Berta perceived the dangers connected to Aguazalca, the, um, the Aguazalca Dam, as something more serious. The company's first security chief, Douglas Giovanni Bustillo, an ex-army lieutenant, didn't bother to contain his disdain for Berta and Copin. He was rude and aggressive to people in Rio Blanco, harassing community leaders like Chico Sanchez, who got so tired of the constant calls and offers of bribes that he changed his telephone number. Bustillo also sexually harassed Berta. My life doesn't make sense without you, he wrote in a text message on 20th of September 2013, just a week after testifying against her in court. The company president was different. David Castillo was a privately educated, bilingual, charismatic, retired military intelligence officer who never directly threatened Bertha. He was much too clever for that, and that's why she was afraid of him. In July 2013, a couple of days before Thomas Garcia was killed in Rio Blanco, Castillo and Sergio Rodriguez, DESA's community and environment manager, went to the Copian Training Centre in La Esperanza, expecting a private sit-down with Berta. But she wasn't alone. Representatives from Rio Blanco and Copian leadership were also there. I don't make the decision, said Berta. I do what the community wants. Castillo offered numerous social projects in exchange for ending the roadblock, but the community said no. Rodriguez complained that while the company was trying to find a solution to the conflict, Copin didn't really care about the communities. It just wanted the project gone. Berta and the local leaders viewed the offer, offer of community projects in exchange for supporting the dam as nothing more than a bribe. Not long after Thomas Garcia was killed, Berta asked Siapa Martinez, director of the Feminist Centre for Women's Studies, for permission to meet with Castillo in the office. That maldito is promising stuff we don't agree with, but things are heavy. I have to talk to him, she said. The meeting didn't last long. After he left, Berta confided in Siapa. That one scares me, he's a military man. A few weeks later, the court issued the arrest warrant against Berta. You see, this is different, she told her daughters. She did warn us, said Bertita. She often mentioned Bustillo, Jorge Avila, David Castillo, and an unscrupulous family of sicarios who operated around Rio Blanco. I documented the threats, I put out press releases, but honestly, I never thought anything would happen to her. Laura, the youngest daughter, agreed. We knew that she was being monitored, and of course we were worried, but this was normal, or maybe we just didn't want to believe it. Hindsight can be agonizing. Have I run out of time or should I keep going? Sorry. Should... Okay, I'm gonna read a bit more. Berta had begun as a junior partner in Copin, but over time her confidence and standing increased as her vision and analysis evolved. She came to understand capitalism as not only an economic model, but a patriarchal one, which dominated women in different ways. That's why she understood that combat combating patriarchal ca capitalism had to start with acknowledging and tackling taboo topics like gender violence, sexual harassment, homophobia and inequality within her own organization. Compa, she would say to Soltero Chavarria, her friend, as they drove to meetings, you know you're a fucking machista. I am, you're right, Admana, but I'm trying to change. They were the best of friends and even serious talk like that ended in laughter. In every space at every opportunity, better tackle gender violence and discrimination head on. 
it's us women that wash that wash clothes and cook we need to protect our rivers we are the heart of our families and the struggle cabrones you need to change all of this machista shit is old she tell her listeners at workshops in far flung rural communities it was uncomfortable and sometimes the men stormed out others insulted her but this motivated her to do more in march in march 2011 bertha convoked a women only weekend assembly um during which she tackled big issues like patriarchy machismo feminism racism sexual diversity and sexual pleasure encouraging participants to share personal experiences of violence discrimination and resistance we have to respect differences we women can cannot stay quiet anymore it doesn't matter if you can't read or write you are smarter than many who you can, many who can your experiences matter this is how we change things she said that weekend the women did not cook or clean or even make coffee instead they were served by male cooking members including salvador this made both men and women easy and uneasy at first but it generated debate and helped change norms within cooking it illustrated bertha's political clarity and conviction and a radical vision that no other organization has not even today so Thank you. Thank you Nina for that powerful reading and and thank you for writing uh thank you for writing this book. I had the opportunity to read it over the weekend and uh it's a story that that needs to be told and needs to be heard um far and wide worldwide. Um um your writing is is captivating and you you managed to capture Berta. Um I remember at the World Social Forum in 2016 Honduran a uh, journalist and friend of Berta uh, Felix Molino Molina said that Berta had three qualities that made her a, such a powerful advocate uh and a defender in did she's indigenous she's a woman and she's a feminist and um all that was very clear from your 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 readings uh um just now and you've also in your book you capture and in the reading as well the context the history the systems in Honduras including uh colonization appropriation of land discrimination economic policy neoliberal policies free trade agreements uh US intervention patriarchy all these systems that led to Berta's murder and ultimately i think make it so difficult to answer that question who killed Berta who as in an individual because it's this web of systems and policies um anyway i'm i'm Rachel Warden i uh i work at Kairos uh as manager of uh, partnerships uh and it's a real privilege to moderate this this book launch and and this discussion um and i'm joined here uh with Nina Kani and two other amazing uh land defenders from Latin America who I have the pleasure of introducing um primero uh quiero presentar a first of all I would like to present Avidalina Morales Avidalina Morales she is a key figure in El Salvador During the past 12 years after the law was approved in 2018 she is a community leader and activist and now she is president of of the Economic Social Development Association in Santa Marta Vidalina has also visited Canada on various occasions and she has spoken about the injustice of mining activities in El Salvador and she was also a friend of Bertas i would also like to present another land defender ivon ramos 
Yvonne Ramos is from Ecuador and she works for Acción Ecológica and she has been working with them for 27 years now. Acción Ecológica or Ecological Action is a partner of Kairos for more than 20 years and she is the coordinator of a, a women's organization, Saramanta Formicuna, Daughters of Maíz, and it is a coalition of defenders, women, defenders of human rights, and defenders of nature in Ecuador. Welcome, welcome Vidalina, and welcome Yvonne. I'm going to ask a question to each of the panelists. I'm I'm going to to start uh, um, uh, with a question for for you uh, for for you Nina um, and uh, you have about seven minutes to answer the question um, uh, and uh, for all of you um, you will be uh, uh, given sort of a five minute warning and then at six and a half minutes I'll 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 appear <laughs> um, but. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, um, Nina, um, uh, um, around um, the book, as I said, you, you do this amazing job of tracing and outlining all the actors and policies and institutions and systems that led to the, uh, um, the focus and the aggressive resource extraction in Honduras, um, the increased need for land defense and the increase of tax and criminalization of land defenders. Um, I was wondering, based on all these interviews that you did uh, on the research you did for this book and your work as a journalist in Central America more generally, what concerns you and what inspires you about the defensive territory, especially when it comes to women land defenders? Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess just to start to say that, you know, um, you know, what I try to do in the book um, is, is um, you know, I, I tell the, the story of the life and death of Bertha Cáceres because you can't understand, you can't begin to understand why she was murdered without understanding who she was and where she came from, you know, and I can't, and, um, and you, you know, it's a cliche, but you can't understand the present without understanding the past. That's absolutely right. And, and I think as well, you can't understand the life and death of Basil Cáceres without understanding the context in which he lived and died. And by context, I mean political, historical, geopolitical, um, military, social, um, and economic, you know, and all of those different um, pull push factors, they, um, they work together, right? And so, um, so I think that's just the basis of understanding the defense of land, um, generally, you know, the defense of natural resources generally and, uh, and you know, and specifically in the case of Bertha. Um, I mean, the, 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 the battle for land and natural resources or the, I'll put it this way, the exploitation of natural resources in land is not a new story in Central America or Latin America. You know, I say this in the book and it's a sweeping generalization, but I think it pretty much is true. Every battle has always been about land, and it still continues to be so. Um, and um, you know, when you even if you go back just a few decades, and you go back to the dirty wars and the civil wars um, of El Salvador, Honduras, of all of it, you know, we've, across across the across the continent, while politically, certainly in Central America, while it turned, you know, Central America was turned into, uh, you know. Um, a, a proxy for this for the cold war between the united states and russia a lot of that a lot of the a lot of the war in a lot of the bloodshed that came before and during um was about a battle for the land and a battle for the riches and natural resources um um in each of these territories um and i i mean i guess what we've seen since the peace accords and i would argue that a motivation for the peace accords, for all of the peace accords um, in Central America and, and even recently in, in Colombia has been um, partly at least motivated by the desire of 
national and international investors to exploit land, you know, for, for, for minerals, for energy, for um, cash crops, for, um, yeah, for dams, for, you know, for rivers, for, you know, for what, for all of those different elements that we, you know, together make up the extractive industry. And we've really seen this roll out in a, you know, without cessation really since the, since the, you know, since the peace accords were signed across the region, you know, so really since the early nineties, um, um, and 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 and, and at, you know, and uh, during that same period, we've seen you know repression, the, the use of force, the use of state, um, of uh, you know of state um, resources um, to repress. And um, to you know, violently repress to crack down on those engaged in the defence of land and territory and water and natural resources also isn't new. There are new things that have evolved. The, you know, these 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 struggles and the and the crackdowns have evolved, and we saw that in the case of Berta, which I'll come on to talk about now. Um, but you know, um, and and in this whole period, we've you know women have been at the forefront of defending land and defending water. You know, that short passage that I just read, Bertha explaining or talking to women at a meeting saying, you know, it's us, it's us women that are at home. We're the ones that are using water. We need the land, you know, to feed our children. That has always been true, you know, and I think women have always been involved in the defence of their territories um, because, Land rights are human rights, you know, um, water rights are human rights, land rights are indigenous rights, you, you can't separate these different things, they're all part and parcel of the fundamental, you know, facets of basic human rights that, um, that, that, that enable or, 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 uh, or prevent individuals and communities from living dignified lives in which they and their children are allowed to fulfill their potential, you know, um, and free lives. I mean, what I, you know, I think what, you know, what I've seen, and better in a way, slightly an exception with this in some ways, you know, um, but generally speaking, um, when all the women that I've met uh, in, across the region involved, um, people like Vidalina, you know, and many others involved in the, in the, in the in the struggle and the um, for, you know to defend land and natural resources is that they do that on top of all of the other responsibilities they have which are given to them for being a woman you know so on top of all of their responsibilities in the home with their children with their grandchildren um, you know cooking cleaning washing clothes all of those things are on top of you know, that, those, those responsibilities very rarely go away. In the, in, in the case of Bertha, it was slightly different um, that she became the international face of Copin and from the beginning was doing lots of sort of traveling, making connections, making alliances and learning from indigenous struggles and other rural communities, not just across Mesoamerica, across the world, you know. Um, and that in itself, you know, opened her, and this, and this happens to many women who are involved in social struggles and land, you know, the defense of land, is that they just by being, daring to be present in that public sphere, they are subjected to, you know, intense criticism. You know, I mean, I write about this in the book that it hurt Bertha terribly to be considered and called a bad mother but including by those in her own family, that people that, that somebody that killed, who cared more about the indigenous people than that she cared about her own children. You know, that criticism of, um, you know, labeling somebody a bad mother um, and a bad woman because you're, you know, you're not fulfilling those roles that patriarchal, uh, you know, um, society d demands of you, I think is something that, all women involved in any type of struggle and, and any type of sort of um, political or public life face continue to face today um and then you know there are there are all they also face the same and different um, um attacks you know i think the sexual harassment um you know is is, is obviously an obvious and key um way of trying to 
threaten and intimidate women involved in different struggles, you know. Um, and I think, um, you know, we've seen, there's been, you know, I, I remember in Honduras, Jazz did a study saying that actually, when you looked at defend, you know, de 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 defensores and defensoras, you know, that actually the number of threats wasn't different in terms of men and women. But what was different is that women, those threats were more likely to turn into physical attacks against the against women and against men. Um, and you know, and I think that um, yeah. So I think that these same sort of tools are used, whether they be threats, bribes, attacks, sexual harassment. They're all used in different, slight, in slightly different ways, you know. And this sort of, um, this I think, this real attempt to discredit women and to try and intimidate them out of these very machista um, spaces, you know. Like um, in the case of Berta, she was dealing with a dam company where, you know, several, several they were all, you know, all, almost all men, you know. Um, including the security to chief, the managers, many of them had military backgrounds, you know, and she was often in these spaces fighting herself. Um, and so I think, it, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible, you know, and it's, and it's meant to be that way, you know, and I think part of the reason Bertha was killed was because she was a woman and was because she was an indigenous woman. I think in this machista sort of patriarchal economic and political model in which um, she existed and we exist, that the idea that an indigenous woman could interrupt, could um, stop them was just intolerable, you know, and it was unacceptable and she was a bad example to others and that, that's, and, you know, and that they couldn't have it. And, and they tried to neutralize her, try to silence her in using many different tactics. And these tactics will be familiar to people like Vidalina who, was you know there and active during the El Salvador um, you know um, civil war these counterinsurgency tactics you know the whole gamut of bribes and threats and intimidation and you know defamation campaigns criminalization all of that same sort of range of tactics were used against but and they're used against women and male defenders today um, and in the end Roberta because they couldn't stop her they killed her. Um, I mean, I think it is. A, I think it's being a defending land. You know, Latin America is the most dangerous place, region in the world to defend land and natural resources. Um, and part of it is part of that reason is also because people, people like pe people, defend their land and natural resources. You know, they know their rights and they organise and they group together and they um, and they and, and and many of these back many of these community struggles are led or co-led by women i think to see women um the way women um manage those spaces and communicate and have them have their voices and and who they represent and how they represent um different perspectives is so important and it's really inspiring i think you know i think in, in, in any workspace, in any arena, whether it's political, social, um, <coughs> labour, having a diversity of voices, gender, sexuality, um, ethnicity, age is vitally important, you know, and I'm, so yeah, I think um, just to finish that, women um, are in these spaces, they've always been leaders um, in the region, in terms of um, in, in struggles and movements, um, um, in, indigenous and rural, um, for the defense of land and territories and for the defense of natural resources. And, uh, and they do that under particularly harsh conditions and particularly in, in, in conservative, machista, patriarchal sort of um, context. Um, and they do that on top of all the, the other responsibilities that are um, that are expected of them just for, be, for, for being a woman, you know, for being women. Um, and so there is very much a lot to be inspired by um, and to admire. Um, and, you know, I think that the response in terms of the support and encouragement and, um, yeah, that, that, that the international <coughs> community needs to, needs to be given to women, to female defenders, is is 
is is huge, but also quite quite particular in the support and resources that they may need to stay safe, and um, to keep their families safe, and to be able to continue in the struggles that they're involved in. Thank you, thank you, Nina. Thank you for for your clarity on uh, I think the critical role of. Of, of women, particularly indigenous women in, in defending the environment and defending land and territory, but as well the, um, the, uh, the, str the struggles and the particular struggles of women, the particular struggles um, of indigenous women and um, that this struggle is a, a, f a feminist struggle. Um, I thank you, thank you so much for your, your clarity. Um, I want to turn now to um, to, to Vidalina Morales, um, voy a hacer esta pregunta en, uh, en español. I'm going to ask this uh, question in Spanish. Vidalina, welcome. Vidalina, como una amiga, una compañera en la lucha. Vidalina is a friend and was a friend of Berta's, and I would like to ask you, Vidalina. Berta has almost become a mythical figure. What would you like the world to know about her? Vidalina says, hello, hello, sisters, friends, everyone who's connected. I would like to say hello to each and every one of you. Every time I'm invited to speak about Berta, I always feel nervous. Because I knew her during very difficult times of the armed conflict here in El Salvador. And even at that time, I firmly believed in the courage, the strength of Berta. And throughout the years, she continued to work on behalf of Copin, which she loved so much. And she fought on behalf of her communities. And I met her in in those large events organized by Copin. For example, there was a big event in 2013. It was an event about militarization. And when we talked about the issues and the situations that Honduras was going through because they had just come out of a coup d'etat. Berta, for me, and for the world, as, as Rachel was saying it in, in the beginning, Berta has become an emblematic figure. I remember three, four years ago, I traveled to Denver, Colorado. And I remember the botanical garden I saw Berta's face. It was beautifully decorated with botanical plants. I never would have imagined that I was going to see her face in a place, in a botanical garden with such beautiful plants. It was such a surprise to me to see that. And Berta was also an international person. And I had the opportunity to get to know her in this struggle that in the past decade has become an incredibly necessary and urgent struggle to defend the environment, to defend life, and to defend our natural resources. That's where I met Berta. And as is said in, in the book, Berta 
would criticize the behavior of male members who were of the Philippine who were very machista. And she had a strong character and she was very courageous and she would speak out about the way they behaved. A friend of mine would say that Berta didn't fit in any of the so the boxes or the the models that society had for us. That she she was greater than that. The society would like to see women as being submissive. Society would like women to always say that everything is good, everything is all right. But Berta wouldn't do that. She would fight against machismo. She would fight against patriarchy. She would fight against this system and this neoliberal model. She stood up against this capitalist patriarchal model. And her criticisms were so relevant. And of course, certain people didn't like what she had to say. They didn't want to listen to these kinds of truths. And her truth was seen as a threat to the transnational and economic power. And it eventually led to Berta's murder. We know that Berta fought hand in hand with Copin, with her communities, so that a dam would not be constructed in that river. And she she fought in every way possible that project in Rio Blanco, and that led her death. Her strength and her courage inspired us. And we, are con we continue to be inspired by her legacy, by her struggle, by the strength of Berta, for her courageousness, for her commitment. She was, she's an example to follow. Berta has always been an inspiration. When I began my remarks, I was saying that she and I met when we were very young. I only I was only 21 years old at the time. I think she was 19 or 20 because we were almost the same age. And she, when I met her, she inspired me so much. She was also a humble woman. She was able to tolerate and put up with a lot of difficulty and conflict. And I remember when we lived in the same house, Berta was so humble. Rachel says, Vidalina, we're having difficulty listening to you. Your audio is breaking up. Rachel says, Vidalina. Bueno, gracias, gracias, Vidalina. Me puede escuchar. Rachel asks, Vidalina, Vidalina, can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Gracias, Vidalina. Thank you so much, Vidalina, for sharing your words and your comments about your friend. I know it's very difficult to only speak for five minutes about a friend and a woman that, that is so important and a woman like Berta. And I think you and Vidalina, you Vidalina are also breaking barriers and breaking molds. It's something that I can, I can also see in you. Now I'm going to ask a question to Yvonne Ramos from Ecological Action, Acción Ecológica. Yvonne, maybe you could speak to us about Berta's legacy, specifically her legacy for women land defenders and for women in Latin America. What is Berta's legacy? Yvonne says, thank you so much, Kairos, for the invitation to participate in this event. I would like to start by sharing a reflection based on a phrase that's from an indigenous woman in Ecuador, the leader of the indigenous movement. Her name is Dolor Capauri, and she would say, we are like a plant that, uh, these are these plants that protect and generate, help water to regenerate itself. It's a sacred place for the indigenous movement. And that's what happened to Berta. And that's what happens with a lot of women land defenders. They are like these plants that are pulled out of their roots but continue to grow. And Berta is in the spirit of all women land defenders. Berta Cáceres has been an inspiration and she has been an inspiration for organization and collaboration in women land defender movements. She has been an inspiration for women human rights defenders, all of Latin America. I am part of the Latin American network of women rights and as a member of Acción Ecológica and as well as a member of Women Defender San Manta, which is the group of indigenous and non-indigenous women in Ecuador. The Latin American Network is an organization of women that has presence in 11 countries and it participates in projects and initiatives that protect women rights and rights of the environment and social and cultural rights, which are threatened by extractive projects such as mining companies and that affect women in El Salvador, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Uruguay, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and Guatemala. And it's important to understand why women, why women are considered enemy number one of extractive industries. And I think it has to do with the fact that women it has to do with our identity and our cultural diversity and the fact that we are women. And it allows us to prioritize the sacredness of life and nature. And it's our responsibility, the responsibility that we've inherited to take care of the land and Mother Earth. And it's something that we have to pass on to future generations.
We know that the balance of Mother Earth and of hum between human beings is absolutely necessary, especially now when the pandemic has shown us that if the balance of nature is disordered, that humans are very vulnerable. And the possibility of the extinction of human beings is something that comes to the surface. We are witnessing natural disasters and that that is a result of global warming. And that global warming is a result of extractive industries. There's a link between land and women. It's a, a link that cannot be broken and it's a space where life is reproduced. And this is a much stronger bond than the economy. It's a symbolic bond and it's historical belonging. And this perspective of women and of indigenous cultures, that way of looking at life does not fit with the capitalist model, which accumulates power and money, which sees nature, human beings, women, and indigenous communities as something that should be exploited. The colonialist power still reproduces these traditional practices and uses violence in all its dimensions. And also the supposed economic stimuli to absorb those logics and those purposes of the And it's the men who have carried this out and who have imposed this model. Then is why women as leaders and land defenders as of the 1990s is a position that threatens that power, patriarchal power and extractive power and it's antagonistic to that model. And it's founded in the exploitation of natural resources. And that is the very reason why this patriarchal model, which is violent, generates more violence. And this violence is characteristic of this model and it's violence against women in order to control and to discriminate and to break the social fabric and the strength of the communities, indigenous and rural communities in Latin America. And this is the benefit of economic groups, national governments that work with transnational corporations. So that use of violence That violence includes stigmatization, harassment, and the use of criminal activity to threaten women, the use of state violence, gender violence, and sexual violence. And these patterns are used all over Latin America. What Berta experienced has happened to many other women throughout Latin America. And this is related to gender because resource extraction affects women even more because food security, the survival of the communities, depends on the well-being and the health of Mother Earth. And extractive industries also rely on violence. Rachel says, thank you, Yvonne. I'm so sorry to cut you off. We just don't have much more time. And we need some time to see the video. Thank you so much for your clarity. And thank you so much 
for the connections you made between extractive industries and violence, and specifically violence against women. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Before finishing, and before giving thanks, we're going to show a video. And this is a video And it includes some words from Berta when she received the Goldman Prize or the Goldman Award. In our cosmovisions, we are seres surgidos. In the version, we are people that have come from the earth, the water, and the maíz. From the rivers are the ones that we must protect them, the Lenca community. And we are also protected by the spirit of the ground. We defend the rivers and give life to protect humans. And we must wake up, wake up, humans. There's no more time. The Gualcarque River is calling us. And just like other rivers that are threatened, we have to respond. We have to wake up. Wake up. There's no more time. Mother Earth militarized, poisoned. Where rights are systematically violated. Mother Earth needs us. Humanity, there's no more time. We need to build societies that are able to coexist in justice in a dignified way that protect life. Let's work together in hope, defending and taking care of Mother Earth. Let's wake up. Let's be more aware. based on racism on capitalism, we need to wake up. We need to wake up humanity. There's no more time. We must wake up. Let's wake up humanity. There's no more time. Thank you. That that was that was beautiful. Um, uh, many times it's said about uh, uh, Berta that she no morió, se multiplicó. She didn't die. She was multiplied, and and you see that in the voices of 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 of, of women and women defenders um, throughout Latin America and throughout the the world. Um, I I want to thank uh, I want to thank everyone. I, I want to thank you for being part of this discussion. Um, I want to uh, encourage uh, everyone to uh, to read the book. Um, we've had um, we've been given a taste of it. Um, we know uh, who Berta is, um, uh, how how she um, how she lived, who her friends were, how she defended her territory, um, how she was an indigenous woman, how she was an activist, um, and we've heard uh, from her friends and 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 people in her networks. Um, we want these discussions to continue. So we're encouraging you to, to um, buy, buy the book and if possible, by supporting your, your favorite independent, independent bookstore. Um, we would be interested uh, as Kairos to continue these discussions and, and to facilitate uh, kind of a, a, a book club or a book discussion on, on this book. So please uh, let us know if you're interested in, in doing that and being part of that, those, that, those book clubs. Um, uh, and uh, Gabriel Jimenez, who is our Latin America Partnerships Coordinator, will uh, send you information um, about that as well. We'll have information on, on our, our, our website. 
Um, uh, as well, um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to let you know that there, um, as part of uh, Indigenous Women's Month, which is is is, is June for for Kairos, it's Indigenous Women's Month. We have uh, a number uh, of other events, uh, including on Thursday, um, we have another webinar uh, uh, called "Stories of Change: Women Defending Land." and water in Canada and Brazil. So that will be Thursday afternoon and there's information on our, our website about that as well on, uh, on Sunday, um, June 21st, we will be launching the, uh, the Canadian content of the, the, the mayor hub. So this is the digital hub on mother earth and resource extraction that, that Crystal mentioned. So stay tuned for more information about that on, on, um, on, on Sunday. Um, but I really wanted to take some time to thank everybody who was involved in this. And so uh, I think everybody's going to come up on the screen now so we can see <laughs> everybody, including, including the translators. So I want to, I want to thank uh, Nina Lakani. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you for writing the book. Uh, I want to thank Vidalina Morales. Uh, I want to thank Yvonne Ramos. I want to thank the Red the Latin Americana, the Mujeres Defensoras. Um, I want to thank Crystal uh, Desilei for opening. I want to thank Gabriela Jimenez, who has uh, been behind the scenes. She is responsible for bringing us all together and making this happen. And yes, she is there. So thank you, Gabriela. Um, thank you, uh, Paulina Baez and uh, Kate Stubbs for interpretation. Um, Please, uh, please remember to um, to uh, to follow the the Mayor Hub on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, look look to our websites for um, upcoming webinars. Uh, please buy the book and please participate in our our discussions uh, about this book and uh, keep uh, keep Berta Cáceres multiplying. Um, Berta Cáceres. Uh, Presente.